Sweet, sweet. Any dates here? Sure. Dave. No, before Russia, though, they came from um, see the border of Germany, Switzerland. Okay. Hanover, Germany. Hanover, Germany. So we have both northern Germany and southern Germany. Jim's family, uh, they were from Ostpois, former East Prussia. Yes. East Prussia. Pomerania. Others? How many of them, uh, when did your parents or grandparents or great grandparents arrive in this country? How many in the 18th century? Any in the 17th century? Your grandfather came in the 17th century. <laughs> Where did they come from? Holland. Holland and where did they go? Yeah, New Amsterdam. Did you know that New York is one of the has one of the earliest, it wasn't called New York at that point, as it belonged to the Dutch. It was called New Amsterdam, and it had a fairly large Lutheran community that were dominated by a reformed tradition. But they were a lot more tolerant of the reformed tradition in this world than they were over in the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, yes? Franklin's ancestors came over with the first Dutch. The first Dutch. And they stopped with the New Netherlands. Yeah, okay, so we in have... the 1650s. Yeah, 1650s, 1640s, it actually could go back into the 1630s. Do you have any others, well, other places that people... And how about 18th century? 18th century. Anyone who came over in 18? Now, some of you said. Oh, 18th century. Is that the 1700s? Yeah, the 1700s. <laughs> yes, yeah, colonial times, but uh, also the time of the revolution. Where did your family come from? From Sweden. Okay, that's right. There are there are Swedes that are coming in. You know where the Swedes? Where did they settle initially? Delaware, yeah, a lot of Swedes came over. Minnesota, yeah, eventually. Not in the 18th century. Delaware, there was a very large Swedish community in the in the Delaware Valley. Uh, and others from the 18th century. Yeah. Scotland and Germany. And where did they settle? In Virginia. Yeah, there were Lutherans in Virginia. Where was the largest group of Lutherans in the 18th century? You know? Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. What southern states had large numbers of Lutherans? North Carolina. Old South of North Carolina and Georgia. Didn't know that, did you? Why do you think there's a southern seminary down there? <laughs> yeah, there it is. It's because of the, there were Lutherans in, in the South. One of the things that Lutherans don't like to talk about is that uh, during the Civil War, we were divided and we had the Lutherans defending slavery and Lutherans attacking slavery. And a lot of Lutherans who didn't care one way or the other. <laughs> it sounds very Lutheran. <laughs> All right, 19th century. How many come? All right, let's go, let's go here. Judy, where did yours come from? Um, from near Lillehammer, that area of Norway. And Norway. Okay, we're going to get back to the Norwegians in a moment. They went to Wisconsin. Wisconsin, okay. From Sweden to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And this was in the late 19th century? Um, 1870. 1870, and, and Judy, yours was when about? Um, 70s. 70s. Yeah, Sweden. Sweden. And where did they go? Uh, Northern Illinois. Northern Illinois. Sweden and Rhode Island. That's unusual. Yeah. Wisconsin. They went to Wisconsin, not everywhere from Germany. Okay, from Germany, though. Clara. And from. Yeah, where, where did they come to go there? Oh, from my, my grandfather from Germany. Germany. Yeah, I know you already told me, but I didn't remember. <laughs> uh, Germany, Hanover area to New York, and then to Minnesota. Minnesota. One side, because we're German and Austrian, um, Ohio, right before the Civil War. Yep, Ohio had a, uh, quite a few. In fact, I, one of the seminaries in Ohio? Capital. Capital, and what's the other one? Uh, 
problem no longer exists. But there were two, because Lutherans, one of the themes of this discussion is Lutherans are very good at disagreeing with each other. They are naturally disagreeable. Uh, uh, they fight over everything. And so that they often found, found in different seminaries, because you couldn't train. Proper Lutheranism could not happen in capital. It had to be in Hama. Or it couldn't be in Hama, it had to be in capital. These are from Rhode Island. The, the, uh, they weren't farmers, they, they were fishermen. Fishermen, yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of Swedish Lutherans in Quincy mm -hmm. that were fishermen. Yes? Um, from uh, Poland, the German settlement way up in that north east corner. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, they were German. They, they were German. Jersey City. Okay. Jersey. All right. From the Crimea, practically the whole town relocated in around the Sioux Falls, Anthony area, South Korea. Others now were. To, uh, the Norwegians came in two waves. One in the late 19th, the other in the early 20th. Do we have any early 20th Norwegians? 20th century. Yes. When did your family come? Um, in 1950. 1950. Well, that's sort of that's even middle 20th century. Yeah, I grew up my father-in-law. 1912, yeah. In Wisconsin. In Wisconsin. 1952. And then I lived uh, from Sweden. Came to Ohio in 1940 and then I arrived in 1965. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one of the th things about Lutherans is that, uh, you know, one possible answer to where did Lutherans come from is they come from countries that had the Lutheran State Church, which would be parts of Germany. Remember, Germany didn't become a whole country until 1870. And so uh, uh, it had many principalities. And some of them were, Luther were Lutheran, some were Reformed, some were Catholic, and some were both Lutheran and Reformed. And so, some of those left the Lutheran Church and formed a branch what became the United Church of Christ. Yeah, I was going to tell that oh. story. <laughs> 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 You know, uh, she learned from me for a while, and I've been learning from her since. <laughs> yeah, the Evangelische Kirche, uh, which was Lutheran, it was a particular uh, uh, church uh, group in Germany, came over and became the nucleus of what eventually, in 1956, I believe, became the UCC. And when you look at the UCC documents, you ask, what are your guiding documents? You will find things like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. But you'll find something very Lutheran, too. Does anyone know what it is except Diane? <laughs> Luther's small catechism is one of the uh, guiding documents for the UCC. Because uh, Lutherans, as we'll see, are actually moved from sort of a reformed edge towards a more Catholic edge to a more evangelical, uh, born again, evangelical in the American sense, edge to a, a very, uh, I don't know, Lutherans are muddled, so it could be a whole range of things. But there are Lutherans who believe that they uh, that feel it's important to be born again. And the, and the experience of that time in their life when they went from their aware, when they have an acute awareness of their sinfulness and then an acute experience of God's love and forgiveness. That's, there's some Lutherans for whom that's very important. There are other Lutherans who, like the historian Marty, Martin Marty, uh, who's a Lutheran, uh, said when asked, when were you born again, he would give the date of his baptism as an infant. At that point, he entered Okay, we've talked about sort of birthright Lutherans, but how about the ones of you who come from, let's start, other traditions as opposed to someone like me who came out of no tradition. Other traditions, where are some of the Lutherans? 
Church of England, and then morph to Episcopal. Okay. And then to All right, so uh, out of the Church of England, Episcopalian, Lutheran, do we have any more like that? Yes? Church of the Brethren. My, my forebears were Lutherans, Germany, came over to Pennsylvania and became right. Church of the Brethren. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mennonite? Mennonite? Yeah. yeah. I'm sort of a mixed bag. My uh, maternal grandparents came from Germany, and they were Lutherans. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they lost their, uh, my grandfather lost his one of his sons, he would not allow the family to go to the Lutheran church. He blamed it on the Lutheran church. So we became Methodists. And then I met my wife, and I went back to the Lutheran church. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And they came in the mid-1800s. Uh, Mid-1800s. Another Methodist here. Methodist? Gro growing up. Okay. Methodist? Scots Irish Presbyterian. Presbyterian. <laughs> and didn't come here. Okay. Uh, I was raised Catholic, but my dad was Presbyterian. Catholic? Presbyterian? Another Catholic. Another Catholic? Yes? An American melting pot. That would be uh, one set of grandparents was Catholics. Uh, Jewish, and the other set of grandparents was Methodist. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. One half was Catholic. One half was Catholic. So, others? How about those of you who come out of no tradition at all? That was my case. I mean, I, my parents took me to a, a Methodist school, or my, me and my brothers, because in the 50s, that's what you did. You, know. you had to Make them go to church, but they were not church goers. And, um, and it, I became a Lutheran out of my study of Martin Luther, which is an odd way to become a Lutheran. <laughs> <laughs> there were a couple of others who had come out of no tradition. Yeah, I was born in Sweden, of course, I was a Lutheran from birth, but my parents, I can remember. Um, hardly ever went, maybe for Christmas. So that was all. And right now, about 3% of, of Scandinavians and Germans who are Lutherans actually attend church on a normal Sunday, between 3 and 5%. Uh, but they do go for Christmas, yeah. marriage, uh, yeah. baptisms, funerals. funerals. <laughs> Now we have to go for the coffee. But, uh, <laughs> uh, and yet they still pay the church tax. Uh, here, here, if we think about, let me give you some ways we can think about this. There is what's, what's called description. That is, it's just described you, because if you grew up in Norway or Sweden, you're a Lutheran, unless you've taken an explicit act not to be. So, uh, there are parts of the Midwest until fairly recently where if you grow up, you know, the town was either Lutheran or Catholic. How many of you came out of backgrounds like that? Or at least, yeah, or at least recognized. So, this is often related to ethnicity. And, in some ways, you can go to some towns in the Midwest, in Iowa or Minnesota or South Dakota, and in a little town at the, which has only four main streets, you know, the crossover, you'll find on the corners a Norwegian Lutheran church, a Swedish Lutheran church, a German Lutheran church, and another Norwegian Lutheran church. And don't forget the Finnish. And the Finnish, yeah, the Finnish could be there, the, the Danes. You know, Lutherans fit the old joke. A, a man is is uh, stranded on a deserted island, spends several years there, and finally a ship shows up, and before he's taken away back home, he says, you want to see what I've done here? And so the captain says, yes, and wanders around and says, here's my house, here's my church, here's my former church. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Lutheran way. <laughs> um, so ethnicity is extraordinarily important in much of this until, and has been until fairly recently. 
when I was the president of St. Olaf College, it was probably more important and more bothersome to people that I wasn't Norwegian, that I, that I was not a birthright Lutheran. Actually, they were mainly concerned because they didn't know my grandfather. <laughs> Although my grandfather actually had been born in Minnesota. I had left a long time ago. Uh, so uh, it's the case that, that for a long time, a mixed marriage was between a Norwegian and a Swede. <laughs> you think I'm kidding. <laughs> in my hometown, back in the early 1900s, the Lutherans couldn't afford to build a church. Well, the Swedish Lutherans and the Danish Lutherans couldn't afford to build their own, own church, so they built a building together, but they did not worship together. Right. They had separate services. Yes. We used to go to Ludifus Supper every year, the dinner that uh, was just two churches, and uh, there was a one-room school, and um, there had been a store, but that was already gone. And there was the Swedish Lutheran Church and the Norwegian, and the only thing separating them was the cemetery that surrounded them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, one of the interesting things you can do if you come out of a birthright tradition in Scandinavia is you can ask, what do you serve with your Lutefist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a religious issue. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah. It has to be butter, not white sauce. Yeah, do you oh. hear that? Does anyone know what Lutefus is? What? Every year? Very common. <laughs> yeah, for those of you who don't know Lutefus, you can count your blessings. <laughs> yeah, Lutefus is a uh, reconstituted cod. Uh, and it, uh, it reconstituted using lye and what have you. It's a little like gelatin. Uh, yeah, and it, it was common, for example, when my wife was growing up in uh, uh, Western Washington State, for them to cook the lutefisk in one house and serve it in another, because it was, <laughs> the making of the lutefisk <laughs> destroyed the experience of the lutefisk, uh, such as it is. When I was president for the Christmas festival, uh, there would be a, a in the in the various uh, courses, the Lutefus course would come, and that would be my time to go around and greet people. <laughs> the whole campus would greet, yeah. literally greet. But they would ask, "Have you had any Lutefus?" Because that was a real um, um, badge of honor, and so I always had at least one piece once during the Christmas season. <laughs> um, on the other hand, there were quite a few folks in our area that would go from church basement to church basement during the Christmas season to keep fed Lutefus. Um, so it, it's amazing what you get used to and how important it becomes uh, ethnically. So ethnicity is an extraordinarily important part of a description, but there are other ways in which you become Lutheran. One of them is marriage. Uh, those of you who were, this last spring I talked a bit about how many uh, Americans now change faith, which is about 50% move from one to another. Marriage is a, a powerful uh, force in that. Mark? Yeah? But are there numbers that say what direction people go when they're married? Does that make yes. sense? Yes, and what do. the numbers show? Like we're Catholic and I was Lutheran. You know, to, is it normally someone becomes Lutheran or both Lutheran or both Catholic? Or? Well, um, it, 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 actually, certain traditions uh, powerfully pull uh, the marriage partner. For example, Mormon. You marry a Mormon, you become Mormon uh, most of the time. Um, others, they seem to go uh, both directions. There's right now an awful lot of folks leaving the Catholic Church. Going into other uh, other traditions, yes. Yeah, in our in our lineage, my 
grandmother, who was Irish Catholic, married a Lutheran, she became Lutheran. Had my mother, who was Lutheran, married my husband, who married my father, who was Catholic, he became Lutheran. I married my husband, who was Catholic, he became Lutheran. Right. <laughs> so in our tradition, everybody was Catholic. Yes. Yeah. Uh, another, another thing is, so marriage plays an important role. Interestingly, liturgy does too. It's much more common for people to move from one liturgical tradition to another, or from a non-liturgical tradition to another. Now, every tradition is liturgical in a certain sense, but the liturgy that we go through, that we'll talk about in two weeks in quite some detail, uh, the one that Diane is right now, Pastor Diane is trying to figure out. Uh, you spent how many, how many years you've been in the... Uh, 30 years. 30 years with a particular liturgy, which is the liturgy of the UCC, which does have Lutheran influence, but it also has Reformed uh, and, and some other influences. And then to move over to this particular liturgy, some things are quite familiar, some things are not, and the order of things is going to be different in interesting ways, uh, often theologically informed ways. So we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Not today, but another time. Uh, but liturgy, if think about how many of you who talked about moving from another tradition have moved from one liturgical tradition to another. That is, Methodists, you have, you have high and low Methodists. I don't know which tradition. Did you did you have the uh, like easy going feel good? Yeah, the worst high when I was Yeah, I mean in the sense that you would you would have the Kyrie, you would have the yeah. yeah. Uh, and so moving from Catholic or Anglican to Lutheran, or from Lutheran to Anglican, or Methodists, at least certain Methodists, it's pretty easy because although. Uh, the order and somehow it might be changed to some degree. For the most part, it's, it's a similar worship experience, or at least closely resemble it. There's another thing that people often do, almost as powerful as ethnicity, is what? What are you thinking? Baptism. Uh, well, the understanding of baptism will be important for at least some people, but for most people, national. Hymnody. <laughs> How many of you were at the, the first service? Okay. How many of you have ever heard that hymn that I am? Uh, okay. I sing a song of the saints of God. Oh, I knew this. Okay. <laughs> that's an Episcopal. Oh, that's an Episcopal. Church church. Yeah. Not in the Episcopal church we went to. <laughs> <laughs> so, hymnody is often important. Lutherans in this country, interestingly, are famous for their interest in music. Because of schools like Luther and St. Olaf. And, uh, but that's not necessarily true in large parts of Europe. Or, uh, that are Lutheran. Some even go to a church that has a, a be big, beautiful organ. Yes, a big, beautiful organ. Uh, uh, many eligible men or women, uh, uh, various special programs. There's a lot of reasons people go to, go to church. Go back, though, to the original theological point, which is that one goes to church, one argues. I mean, theological, theologically we claim that people who go to church are called by God, called and assembled by God. The reason you might go to, as there was a complaint during Luther's day that that all that the young people did when they come to church was trying to meet members of the opposite sex, uh, which was undoubtedly true. But uh, as Augustine said, uh, God uses even our sinful desires in order to bring about God's purpose. And actually, meeting the opposite sex is not that sinful. Uh, uh, so, and then there's just there's, there's choice in today's world. There's considerable more choice. If you grew up in a part of Germany, uh, let's say in Hamburg, in the 19th century or the 18th century, you were going to be Lutheran or Catholic, or probably Lutheran, irrespective of what you believe. 
Uh, and you would have been raised that way and it would have simply been assumed. That's, that's what you are. You were raised in Norway. You would be Lutheran of one of two forms. Does anyone know what the two? How many of you have heard of the, the name Hauge? Yeah. yeah. Who's he? No, that's Hauge. No, that's Marty Hauge. Yeah, Hauge is, yeah, no, that's Hauge. Hauge. I'm really surprised. Uh, Hauge was a pietist and it plays a major role in the free church tradition within Norway. And there are many Lutherans who belong to the state church, but there are a lot of Lutherans that also belong to the so-called Freie. I, I don't know how to pronounce it, Freie which would be in German. Uh, uh, in Sweden, there are these two groups. Can you tell me what they are? Yes, The state church. Yeah, the state, yeah. And there, there is a pietist tradition in most uh, Lutheranism. Uh, uh, does anyone know what pietism is? Awfully strict. It could be yeah, awfully strict. Saint Olaf came out of the Hagialler tradition, and you couldn't dance. Dancing was a vertical expression of a horizontal desire. <laughs> <laughs> Would the Wisconsin Synod be an example of the pietist? It would be, but it's very conservative, even more conservative. My mother didn't have Blue laws. Yeah. I thought they would have been at Ephraim and Sylvania. Yes, they were. Pietism, yes. Would you call it fundamental? Uh, no, not uh, conservative in some cases, but not always. Piet, but let's step back a minute. If we, if we go back to the 16th century, where Lutheranism, you know, the, where uh, that sack of maggots was actually a professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg, uh, and first, beginning in, you know, really in, in 1517 with the 95 Theses, but really in 1520 with a number of important treatises, attempted a reform of the Catholic Church. With the upshot that he, would, he failed at the reform and ended up establishing a new Christian uh, church, which was called the Gage, or by the opponents called Lutheran. Uh, remember, Luther did not like that term. Uh, Luther himself died in 1546, and but before that he published, he, he did thousands of sermons, thousands of letters, published hundreds of treatises, and we'll be talking about those in the next two times, among other things. Uh, but he also uh, was at the birth of the new institutional church, and because the Catholic Church, which in the 16th century was like a government, it had large portions of, of uh, Europe were literally controlled by bishops or monks, abbeys. You know, there were states. It was like it would be like the whole county is controlled uh, uh, by. The church. And then even in things that were controlled by princes or counts or, or what have you, uh, a large portion of it uh, was still controlled by the church. So if you had a, just a marriage dispute or a dispute about a contract, you'd go to a church court. If you had a dispute about, say, criminal matters, you'd go into a secular court. So the church and state were interwoven. But with the, with the development of Lutheran or Evangelic and then reformed, early reformed, uh, there was a great deal of violence that broke out because people believed that the whole community had to be of the same belief and same practice. And, that, and so there was actually a war right after Luther died and the Lutherans lost for a, a while. And then one of the people who had been on the Catholic side turned coat and rejoined the Lutherans, and the Lutherans won. And so in, in 1555, it was decided that Cuius Rego, Rego, Eus Religio, which means he who rules 
decides what the faith is. And so religion became a state matter. And then after the Thirty Years' War in 1650, it, uh, well, in 1555, it, the only two legal religions were Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and Lutheranism. After the Thirty Years' War, they added the Reformed tradition. And in the in, in, during that period, they had civil wars in Germany, France, England, the Netherlands, a whole range of places, not in Scandinavia, well, they have civil wars, but not over religion, uh, in which they attempted to use force to impose Lutheranism or Catholicism or Reformed doctrine on the larger population. Uh, because of those wars, during some of those wars, some people decided to get the hell out of there, and they came to America. And so some of the 17th century, uh, that is the 1600s, the Lutherans that came there were often escaping uh, the religious strife and the persecution in the old country. Beginning in the... So basically, religion becomes the glue that what are called absolute monarchies are using sort of the ideological glue to hold the community together. Uh, and it even gets to the point of a place like Prussia, where the churchmen are also uh, civil servants. The pastor reads government proclamations from the pulpit and is also the local administrator of the draft. Uh, that the military chaplain the army is there just to make the army function more uh, efficiently. So, there, so a number of our forefathers and foremothers came here to escape this situation in the early period. But there's also many of the people of the time reacted against it as well, and they reacted against a bureaucratic, state-run, highly theological, uh, prone to argumentation about theological fine points. And they move towards a more emotional, a more inward, less theological, more biblical, more lay religion. And these are the ones called pietists. Pietism, it was during this period that the large group of Scandinavians and Germans came to this country. And so Lutheranism in this country tends to be much more pietistic. One of the hallmarks of pietism is Bible reading. Now, how many of you heard the story that when Luther was a young monk, there was only one Bible that was chained to a to the uh, pulpit and no one was reading and it was covered with dust? How many of you heard that story growing up? Yeah, it's all fake. Uh, uh, but it was true that most people couldn't read and Bibles were very expensive. A broad reading population that could read the Bible the way Luther wanted to read it was about 100 years in the future after Luther's death. And pietism, in part, was formed of small little conventicles or smaller groups that would read the Bible to each other uh, and look after each other's spiritual health. And it was a reaction, in part, to this authoritarian, state-run, highly theological. And it, it, its argument was, the most important thing is to be a good Christian, to love others, to study the Bible, to realize the priesthood of all believers, and not be in this bureaucratic, uh, spitzwindy, uh, uh, sort of detail-oriented, tiny little differences uh, that was true for the, uh, the church. And that's, that form of Lutheranism vitally influences uh, the, the uh, Lutheranism that we find over here. This thing happened in Germany, and the people uh, that are known, probably the best known, are a man named Spainer and then Franca. Franca was probably the leader of what was called the Halle School, after the town of Halle. And he actually corresponded with some of the most important Lutheran founders in this country. How many of you have heard of the, of the College of Muhlenberg? How many of you know who Muhlenberg is? 
a little bit early reformers and pastors. Yeah, he was one of the early, he's, he, he's one of the prime founders of Lutheranism, especially German Lutheranism, in this country. And he regularly corresponded with Franke. So the Lutheranism that, that we know uh, comes out in this country, particularly out of the uh, pietistic sort of anti-government tradition. There's a one group, how, however, where it came out of persecution, and they're German. Do you know which group that is? Missouri Synod. Missouri Synod. Are, which are founded in the 19th century, mid-19th mid century, are fleeing from Germany where the, uh, the King of Prussia and others are trying to impose on the Lutherans a reunification with the Reformed, or a unification with the Reformed. The, the Union Church is supposed to have both Reformed and Lutherans together. And these, these are highly passionate, confessional Lutherans. And so they leave and come here. Let me now close because we're yes. Throughout this, from the beginning to the end, was there a change from being part of a group, um, you know, like, like in the Old Testament, and God's people, to, to the individual separate? Belief of your religion? You mean to, to go from group belief to individual belief? Right. Is that more long in this? Pietism is often very individual because forms of pietism associated with Frank also had conversion experiences. You, you, it was very important to tell the time that you were feeling sinful and, and what have you, and suddenly realized that God has saved you by God's grace, apart from anything you've done. That was an important part of your life. That's the one, again, often we talk about in evangelical circles. Um, that is very individualistic if you, if you focus in on your individual experience. But pietism and Lutheranism often counteracted that by putting together small prayer groups and small Bible study groups and what are called conventicles or ecclesiology and ecclesia, small churches within house churches, which were all attempts to maintain the community even as one celebrated that individual experience. Today, individualism is generally the dominant mode of religious ex expression and experience in this country. Let me close in just the last few minutes by going back to the definition of Lutheranism. Um, one way is the way of the scripture. You can say Lutherans are the people who come from certain places. Or, in cases of Africa and, and um, parts of Asia, parts that were in the colonial enterprise of Germany or, or Denmark. Did you know the Virgin Islands were Danish for a long time, so there's a large Lutheran population of African Americans uh, that, that come out of the fact that uh, part of the colonial enterprise for Denmark was to over several Virgin Islands. Tanzania similarly has a, a background out of colonial. Uh, but they have made Lutheranism their own in their own particular way, and that's true of Lutherans around the country. One of them, the world, one of them is by description and ethnicity. That doesn't work very well, especially when you get a group as various as this. So you could say, could it be creeds or uh, you know the apostles? Well, most of uh, the, or much of the Christian Church agrees with the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed, maybe the the Creed of Constantinople is maybe a little more difficult, but the four ecumenical creeds often define many. So how do you, is it people who follow Luther? No, because there are a lot of things that Luther did that a lot of Lutherans wouldn't agree to. One of the things, there are what are called confessional Lutherans that subscribe to the Book of Concord, this big fat book, and this is the English translation, I can bring in the German and wave that too if you want. Uh, which was uh, agreed to in 1577, in 1580, uh, to stop a bunch of fighting among more conservative and more uh, accommodating Lutherans in the 16th century. Lutheranism divided even before Luther had died. 
we are a Fisperous religion. You know what that word means? It's fun to say. Fisperous. We divide up easily. We split and splinter. But what are when you look at the Missouri Synod, what are their colleges called? Concordia. What does that stand for? The Book of Concord. They are confessional, they hold to the whole book. What uh, what do the Swedish Lutherans call their colleges? Augustana. What's that named after? Keep thinking. It's, it's, a, it's the Confession of Oxford. Yeah, 1530. And most ELCA Lutherans, that's the important part of the teaching the whole thing in seminary, but the one we find about is the interpretation of the 1530 uh, Augsburg, Confession of Augsburg. This book contains the Confession of Augsburg, the creeds, several Luther's treatises, the small catechism and the large. Remember, the small has been picked up by the UCC. So Swedish Lutherans in the Augustana tradition hold to really important one for them, confession, is this one piece, whereas the uh, Missouri Synod say the whole thing. And both of them, what they mean by that has changed over time as the world around them uh, has changed. Uh, so confession is one way of uh, dealing with where do Lutherans come from. Lutherans come from those who hold to a particular confession. But even setting that, you haven't solved the question because you can have a narrow definition or you can have a broad. By a, a certain broad definitions, Pastor Harvey is as much a Lutheran as many other Lutherans are. By a narrow definition, most of us are not Lutherans. The Missouri Senate will not commune with any of us because we are not true Lutherans. We are not uh, fully um, one with this particular document and the peculiar interpretation of the voice of it. So, next time, you have an assignment. Um, we're going to talk about what Lutherans believe. I'd like you to please bring a list with you of what you think are the key things that Lutherans believe. Or, failing that, what are the key things that you believe? I won't ask you on the latter. Because often, you know, I, I stand up and recite the uh, uh, Nicene Creed. To do it. But there are parts of the Nicene Creed where even I, who studied it, uh, you know, as an academic, don't know what I'm professing <laughs> at that particular point. Uh, so bring with you what you think would, would be the belief statements that Luther's would make, and we'll do something similar to what we did today. Then. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.